Hey folks, welcome to Black Gumbo. How about another edition of Gardening Q&A? All right, so I have my set of questions here that you guys have asked me in the comment section, and I've pulled out a lot of them that seem to be uh, compelling questions, things that, that I know the answer to. So uh, Roxy K asks that, uh, well, she's growing Celebrity tomatoes this year, they're neither determinate nor indeterminate. Would you prune prune these like an indeterminate tomato or would you let it bush out? Yeah, there's a there's a class of tomatoes. There's there's it's not the it's not a real common class called semi-determinates. But even though it's not common, some of the most popular tomatoes come from semi-determinate from that kind of growth habit. And when we talk about determinates, indeterminates, or semi-determinates, what we're talking about is the growth habit of the plant. Indeterminates are the vining types. They grow and grow and they grow an indeterminate amount of time. They put off, uh, they'll, they'll just keep growing if the conditions are right. And so you have to prune those and train those. And that's why people pinch the suckers and, and prune up their, their tomato plants up a trellis because it's gonna keep growing. And once it gets to the height you want, then you can let the suckers grow out and it will fruit for you. <clears throat> this is an indeterminate. This happens to be my single seed challenge. And you can see what I've done is I've pruned off the, the leaves and branches and suckers down here that were touching the ground and also the suckers that were, uh, that were down there because I want this area to be open, I want good airflow and I'm going to let it bush out from here and I'm going to let it fill this cage and I'll top it right about here. On a determinate variety though, it's a more, they call them bush types, uh, they're, more, they're more stocky, oftentimes you'll see them looking like little bonsai trees. Uh, they'll grow up to a certain determined height or size. They'll put on their fruit and they either have uh, you know, one or two flushes of fruit and they're done. They, they grow to a determined time. You don't prune those kind. You let them bush out and you let them, you let them give all the production you can. So it pays to look what you have. These in these pots down here are all determined. You can see that they look like little trees, like little miniature redwoods or miniature trees with a trunk and they branch and they're bushy. So these don't even need to be supported in most cases. These are dwarfs and micro dwarfs and they look like little trees. You don't, you don't trim these, you don't prune them, but what you would do is maybe come in and take off some of this growth that's touching the ground down here. What about a semi-determinate? What, what, one that's neither determinate nor indeterminate? Um, some of those will grow up and act like a determinate. They, they have all kinds of different varieties of growth habits within this class and it really depends on the variety you have. But with all tomatoes, no matter whether they're semi-determinate or determinate, you do want to trim up the bottom portion of the plant so that its leaves aren't touching the ground. On a semi-determinate plant, that's all I would do. I would prune the, the branches that grow and, and come in contact with the ground because those branches um, are, are going to be vectors for disease and for early blight and things like that. Uh, you don't want your tomato plants touching the ground um, in most cases. And so that's what I would do, Roxy. I would go ahead and just prune off those branches, those leafy branches that tend to hang down. Uh, your semi-determinate may or may not give you one or two flushes of fruit. It may give you several. Uh, it may kind of act like an indeterminate, but uh, it'll stop growing at a, port at, at a certain time in the year. I don't, I don't know. There's so many different variables within that class of tomatoes, within that growth habit. Um, that I would just go ahead and let it grow and bush out and see what happens. Susie QT 1980 asks, this is my second year gardening. I have four raised beds and several fabric pots. I fill the pots with peat moss, garden soil, potting soil, perlite, worm castings, and bone meal. The question is, I've read that garden soil is too heavy and now I'm worried that it will hurt my plants. Uh, what are your thoughts about what I've mixed together? Um, I also have compost I could add to it also. Yeah, um, garden soil is different than potting soil, but with all the stuff you've put in there, um, I don't think you have to worry about it. You've put a lot of amendments in there that loosen up the soil. The, the, the thing is, garden soil that they sell you know, down at the big box store is um, not as light and fluffy and filled with organic material as a dedicated potting mix. A dedicated potting mix is usually uh, heavy on the peat moss and that's uh, that's so it can retain water when you put soil in your garden or you have the native soil or you have a raised bed and you've put some garden soil in there um, 
you, you've got a whole large area that's largely insulated with that level ground that uh, holds water a little bit deeper down. If you dig into even a dry looking garden bed, you'll probably find moisture down several inches. Uh, it can hold that because it's, it's a large flat space. And the only surface area that's exposed to evaporation is, is the surface area. But in a pot, you've got a lot more temperature shift because the pot is smaller and it has the surface and all its sides are exposed to different, uh, different rates of, of temperature shifts. And so they dry out really quick. And so what you want to do is put something in your pot that retains moisture. You want a potting mix. And the potting mix that you've made actually sounds really good. You've got all that organic material in there, the peat moss. Uh, you've amended it a bit, so it, I think you're fine. But um, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna grow in pots, you need to make sure that you're using a mix that's four pots. I like to uh, use a bagged potting mix, commercial bagged potting mix, because the one I have, the one I buy, is amended with bat guano, uh, a little bit of compost, and uh, it's got a lot of organic material in it in the form of, of uh, hardwood chips that have been composted. Um, but I like to extend that also by adding half and half uh, peat moss to my bagged potting mix. And then I'll also add sometimes perlite if I have it on hand. And uh, that's a good, nice, loose soil that's uh, served me well for many years. All right, next question. Elaine Martin asks, what kind of pumpkin do you, do you grow? She asked this in my pumpkin pit video. Uh, and how much room do they need? Um, yeah, you can, in a pumpkin pit, the idea is that you're planting a, a singular space. Uh, you, you can plop them in anywhere. It's just you dig a hole, you fill it with unfinished compost and, and kitchen waste and scraps like that. Um, and then you cover it up and you plant crops on top of that waste pit that thrive in that kind of environment. Things that do well in a pumpkin pit or a melon pit are uh, melons, squashes, all kinds of squashes, including the pumpkins. And uh, they do really well in that situation. Uh, corn is also one that will do well uh, with buried waste. Obviously, we've all learned the story of the Native Americans teaching the uh, pilgrims how to grow with, uh, you know, grow corn, squash, and, and beans with fish being used, raw fish, as the fertilizer. So that's the, that's the basics of a pumpkin pit. So the varieties I like to grow, I'm learning. And what I've learned is there are a couple of options when choosing a pumpkin type squash. Um, last year I really wanted to grow Jaradale and Moringa. These were two beautiful pumpkins that had real beautiful salmon flesh. The Jaradale was a, um, I think it was the Jaradale, was a beautiful uh, blue-green pumpkin on the outside with salmon pink flesh on the inside. Man, I really looked forward to those. But they were Cucurbita maxima, which is a very common uh, type of, of squash. Cucurbita maxima includes all kinds of cultivars and, and, and uh, named varieties that you can buy. Uh, Cucurbita maxima is a little less suited to my area. It's very susceptible to vine borers and it's very susceptible to heat and it doesn't root along its path as the vine grows uh, as well as it could, uh, as well as other kinds do. And so my two pumpkins of that variety failed last year. They got real big, they put on flowers, and then they died to vine borers. So I didn't get to grow those. Um, I was talking with David the Good. He's a gardener. Go follow his channel. Uh, he writes good books, too. Um, I was talking with David, and he's like, man, you got to grow cucurbita machadas, which include like the Seminole pumpkin and varieties like that. They're a little more uh, subtropical pumpkin. They're a little more heat tolerant and they're a little more resistant to the vine borers. And the reason they're resistant is as they vine, you let them sprawl out. And along the nodes on that vine where the leaves come out, where they touch the ground, they can root. They can root into the ground. And you can encourage that rooting by mounding soil over that node where it grows uh, along, along wherever you let it grow. And um, the Cucubita machada, like the Seminole pumpkin, that's what I grew this year. Unfortunately, they didn't come up. I'm going to grow another variety of squash in my pumpkin pits this year that's not pumpkins. Uh, currently I'm growing uh, some yellow squash in a couple of my pits. I'm growing some cantaloupe melons in another pit and I will be growing in my two new pits that I'm just putting in right now um, a little type of an acorn squash. The seeds are on their way to me. So, um, and they are cucurbita moshadas. So that's, that's what you want to look for if you have a problem with vine borers. 
is uh, you want to be able to grow something that is naturally uh, kind of has a defense against those those borers. Because if man, this plant has had so many problems with the borers, but uh, it's still going. It's rooting along its vine. It's putting down roots along the nodes on its vines, and that's keeping this plant alive, so that it can lose leaves back here to the vine borers and keep growing. So hopefully we'll get some pumpkins. There's a few blossoms down there. I don't know if there's any female blossoms down here. Those are all males. Next question. Um, a lot of folks have been watching my videos and asking me, hey, what's that light colored mulch that you use on all your, on all your potted plants? Uh, what is that stuff and where can I get it? Well, it's rice hulls. It is a renewable product. It's a waste product of the rice industry. This is the, the shell on the kernels of rice. It's basically the chaff that, that uh, they have to process rice and, and take this stuff off. And this stuff is really incredible stuff. You can also use this stuff as a replacement for perlite. Um, some folks mix this into their garden soil to help give uh, the soil some, some tilth and aeration. And that's a, that's a viable thing as well. Uh, this stuff comes in a 50 pound bale and people are wanting to know where I got it. I got mine at AM Leonard, which is an online garden and agricultural supply place. And they come in these big 50, these giant bales of 50 pounds. <laughs> and I guess I've got about 20, 25 pounds left. That's a, that's a big bale. I bought that two years ago and it's been lasting me and lasting me and lasting me. So the benefits of using this is that I can just pour it on real easy. Uh, on, you saw my micro tomatoes in some videos that I've done. I use this as the mulch because it, it's lightweight, it's, uh, it's good for smaller spaces, and it's good if I need a real flat uh, mulch bed. So uh, I like this stuff. It also is good for, um, you can make biochar out of this stuff. I've seen some, some folks in Asia making biochar for their garden with big piles of these rice hulls. Uh, these also have trace elements that are good for your soil. Um, they have uh, micronutrients that are good for your soil and slowly over time they'll break down in your soil and compost in place. So yeah, rice hulls, a very good renewable uh, option for gardeners to use for uh, a perlite replacement and for uh, potting soil. Okay, next question. Janice Granier, question, is it bad to use shredded paper, old bills, etc., in your garden co or compost? I know not to put plastic window envelopes in there, but shredded paper, is that okay? Um, yes, yeah, shredded paper is absolute gold for your compost. Uh, all paper products are suitable for composting. They provide you a good source of free carbon, which is your browns, which balance out your nitrogens, which are your greens, and your compost needs both. So yes, it's a very good option for that. I would not use it directly in the garden, however. If you mix shredded paper into your soil, thinking, well, maybe I can amend my soil with that. Uh, what that's going to do is bind up uh, resources that your plants need because all the bacteria and, and soil life in your soil is going to go to work breaking down all of that paper and they're going to need the nutrition to live and thrive and break down all that stuff that your plants need. Um, I guess theoretically you can use paper as mulch. Uh, technically cardboard is paper. I use cardboard as mulch all the time. Lay it sheeted right on top of the surface of the soil and cover it over with something to hold it in place like uh, you know, a layer of, of, uh, of, of wood chip mulch. But that, that cardboard um, is, at, is it on the horizon where the soil and the paper product meets. And you will have a little bit of bacterial action going on there, but it's just there. It's not down where your roots are. So you can use paper as a mulch in that regard. And um, that would be a good use of paper products in your garden, but don't mix it in the soil. But in the, in the compost pile, yeah, let, let me show you what I've got going on. In my compost bin, I have a lot of uh, grass clippings today, and that provides a lot of nitrogen. There's some leaves down in there, especially these oak leaves. Those are going to take a while to break down, but they were mixed in my grass. I needed that grass because there are a couple of big, giant redfish carcasses buried in here. I can't smell them right now, and I shouldn't smell them as they break down and within a week or two they'll they'll be gone. Uh, this carbon, all these paper clippings here will really help to uh, get this uh, these grass clippings going and I, I'll wet them down and I'll come back about a week later and turn all this over. Now I've said it before, paper-based products like these egg cartons made of uh, wood pulp fiber 
uh, make very good additions to your compost. They provide a lot of carbon. They break down to virtually nothing. They're, they're actually mostly air. But uh, I put a layer of these on top of my compost and water them in real good. They virtually, you know, they get real soggy. And if you've got grass clippings, put some grass clippings on top of this and just layer your compost. But yeah, paper products, man, that's good for your compost. You put paper in your compost, you live 100 years. Okay, next question. Hypocentric asks, when do you start fertilizing the tomatoes? That's a good question. Um, a lot of us are starting tomatoes in spring and we got our seedlings coming up. And I would not fertilize when they are this small. They don't really need it yet. Uh, you can see that the first, the first leaves that came off, they're called cotyledons, are turning yellow and will drop off. That's natural, that's what they're supposed to do. The plant feeds off of what's stored in these leaves uh, as it's growing a new root system and then the, the true leaves start coming in afterwards. What I would do is wait for when your plant looks like this, when it has at least four sets, one, two, three, four, and there's one down there, of true leaves. Uh, four sets of true leaves, is, is a, that, that indicates the plant's getting along pretty well and you can start fertilizing at that point. And so uh, I like to use a, a half strength, uh, low dose organic fertilizer. I actually start with fish emulsion with my tomatoes, but I cut it in half even then. And I just give them a low dose because uh, these plants, they're, they're young and they're tender and they're just getting their feet wet and you don't want them to uh, die from an overdose basically. Hey, thanks for joining me on Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Man, we got 30,000 subscribers just yesterday. 30,000 subscribers to our channel. Thank you so much, I'm so humbled. Uh, it's so good to have so many people uh, in our community commenting and, and chatting back and forth. That's where we get these questions from for these Q&A, so I appreciate that. And I'm so, so grateful for all those subscriptions. Um, like us on Instagram and Facebook, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.